last week. Somehow, the thing I'm always afraid of is that, is that since it's kind of uh, cosmology is like a huge uh, assortment of topics that uh, as we're learning about as we're learning about the next one, the the early ones will begin to drop out the other side of your head. And uh, so you know, just uh, take a moment to think back. Week one, right? The basic idea was to was to get a picture of, 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 of a geometric picture of what the FRW universe uh, looked like, how it how it responded to uh, the homogeneous matter content that was present. So if you put in some matter with equation of state W is equal to P over rho, you know how does how does the universe expand? If you turn on spatial curvature, positive or negative, uh, how does that affect the expansion? Um, uh, and uh, and then also we you know the other geometric point was how geodesics behave how their momentum redshifts is one upon a and so for massive there was the there was what that meant for massive particles uh, which is basically they came to rest with respect to the cosmic expansion with respect to they became co-moving observers over time uh, and the uh, massless particles were. They're like the pho like photons, they just get redshifted by the expansion of the universe, uh, and uh, yeah, and we and we just drew our sketch of what the of what the evolution of the universe looked like uh, according to uh, the current standard model, just at the homogeneous level, and we marked a few uh, important points on here that we would get back to later. But there was Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which was when the universe was about a billion times smaller than it is today, when the scale factor was about a billion times smaller. And the temperature was one MeV, so of order nuclear, just sc you know, scales of nuclear physics. Uh, there was the cosmic microwave background, when the universe suddenly became neutral, all the electrons and, po and protons decided to bind together into atoms. That happened shortly after the universe became matter dominated. So radiation domination first, matter domination, and uh, dark energy or vacuum energy domination. And so shortly after one of these transitions, the cosmic microwave background photons were released. We said they're a perfect black body uh, and they have tiny fluctuations in them. And then we live right after another transition. Uh, so this is us. Um, okay. And then week two, uh, in short, was about uh, thermodynamics in the expanding universe. Um, so some basic some basic uh, notions that, that you're supposed to uh, carry, carry away with you into your old age are that uh, we, we, we derived that as the universe expands uh, quasi-adiabatically, when, when, when it's dominated by radiation and it, and it expands quasi-adiabatically, so if, if, if the, if the uh, interactions of this, of this relativistic plasma are strong enough that they're that they're keeping it in, in quasi thermal equilibrium as the universe expands, uh, then the temperature goes down as one upon a, and uh, you know since t is about the t has the t is about the energy of the collisions t is roughly speaking the energy with which the particles are moving and 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 which with which uh, collisions are are taking place, uh, so you know this is the important point for fundamental physics is that that as you trace the universe back to very small a T gets extremely high. The universe ultimately was a much more high energy collider than anything we'll ever be able to reproduce here on Earth. Um, and so potentially produced all sorts of interesting stuff that we'll never be able to produce today. And that interesting stuff, for example, for example, it could produce interesting stable particles that we'll never be able to reproduce in an experiment on the Earth, but that if they're stable, once they got reproduced in the early universe, they just hung around until the present day and you can detect them you know, detect their cosmological effects one way or another. Uh, yeah, and uh, anyway, so uh, another important thing was that when the universe adiabatically expands, uh, uh, it, uh, the entropy density, the, the, you know, the, since the entropy is conserved, the entropy per unit physical volume goes as a to the minus three, so it dilutes as a to the minus three, and it, so that leads to a very sort of helpful trick that you can use again and again in, in, in evaluating uh, models of the early universe, which is to say, you know, one basic consistency check you should do if you have any model uh, and you want to ask, does it, is it consistent with cosmology, 
is you go through and you ask what are the different masses of the particles in my theory. And now as the temperature cooled past those masses and those particles became non-relativistic, uh, uh, you know, how much were, how thermal equilibrium wants to kill them, they want, 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 wants, to, wants to remove these particles from the thermal bath and suppress their number density, density exponentially. Um, how far does it get in doing that? So at some point they get so rare that thermal equilibrium, which is based on the assumption that those particles are undergoing a lot of the relevant reaction in, in one Hubble time, that that approximation becomes bad and, and thermal equilibrium quits, to be quits being effective. And for example, if this is a stable particle, it just hangs around, it's number density, uh, it, 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 the total number of these particles after that moment, after that quote unquote freeze out, doesn't change. Um, and so the number density, the number per physical volume, again, goes like a to the minus three. In other words, it, go, it goes like number which is conserved over volume, which goes as a cubed. Uh, and so then that led to a, just a simple but really extremely useful point, which is just, you, you know, if you ever have a particle that freezes out, you should just note that the ratio of its entropy, that, that, that after it froze out and under the assumption, which is often good, that the universe expanded adiabatically between then and today, the ratio of its number density at freeze out to the total entropy density uh, of the radiation bath was constant between then and today. Uh, and, uh, and so often if you just evaluate, if you, if you, if you just you know, take this equation that S at freeze out over A at freeze out, Sorry, S it frees out over the number density it frees out is equal to S today over the number density today. This is a measured number. These two guys often you can calculate in your theory and get some ratio in, in terms of the parameters of your theory and get a prediction for the number density of these particles today. And a basic check is if you, if you, if you now use that number to calculate their energy density today, let's, which supposing they're non-relativistic would be like this. You know, is it is that is that greater than the critical density today? Uh, in which case, you should find a new theory, uh, or is it less than the critical density today? Much less than the critical density today. In which case, you don't just irrelevant, uh, or is it equal to the critical density, roughly speaking? In which case, it's the dark matter. You've discovered the dark matter. Uh, okay, yeah, and uh, so we applied this to. First of all, two important thermodynamic tr transitions that we uh, do understand well and that give us, give us our, most, uh, our best evidence about the early universe and the, the, the correctness of the Big Bang model at early times. There was, there was, there was Big Bang nucleosynthesis again uh, where we were able to, on the back of an envelope, estimate that the amount of helium in the universe uh, today should be about 75%. Sorry, that's backwards. It should be 25% and the amount of hydrogen in the universe should be about 75% in agreement with observations. Uh, and we, we also met, and you're meeting a little bit more in your homework, the, the corresponding calculation for the cosmic microwave background, where you can use these basic rules to figure out that it, uh, that this, this transition did indeed happen when the universe was about a factor of a thousand smaller than it is today. Um, uh, Um, and uh, and then we, we, we applied it to, and then we spent the, we, we, we applied it a little bit to the, to the uh, discussion of, of uh, dark matter. Uh, well, we spent the last two lectures talking about dark matter and dark energy. Uh, what the, uh, trying to give a, a basic sense of, of what the, what the observational status of these two guys are, what, what, what directions people are thinking uh, about in order to explain them. In particular, dark matter, a bunch of the candidate theories uh, have to do with uh, applying an argument of, the, of, this, of this sort, the same sort. Um, and, uh, but really the bottom line is we don't know what's going on with either of these guys, although the evidence for them continues to accumulate, the evidence that there's something going on. Uh, maybe the main takeaway point beyond the fact that we don't know what's going on is that there have really been quite a large diversity of different efforts to uh, detect both of these things non-gravitationally and uh, 
uh, and that, 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 has, that has so far had no payoff. So these guys appear to only show up through their gravitational interaction, uh, despite the fact that a lot of the proposed theories for them uh, would have predicted that they would be visible in some other way. Um, so are, are, are these just extremely well-hidden uh, matter components uh, that we only detect gravitationally, or is there something wrong with Einstein's gravity? I think that's an open question. The only thing I wanted to emphasize at the end of last lecture was that, um, uh, you know, if the, I don't say that this is a reason to prefer this explanation over the other one, but the, there's actually been pro recent progress. There's so, so, something qualitatively has changed recently in terms of the possibility that, that, it's, that it's modified, that it's a modification of Einstein's gravity, which is that we basically found a modification of Einstein's gravity, which is uh, uh, good enough to seriously, to take seriously and study um, its cosmological effects. Okay. So now I, uh, this lecture I want to do, so, so, so this, this week it's going to be all about uh, the initial conditions, if you want. So for starting off with, again, the, the thing I didn't get to do, I want to just very briefly touch on uh, baryogenesis, or in other words, why is the, why is the universe uh, made of matter instead of antimatter? What, what accounts for the apparent one part in a billion asymmetry between matter and antimatter in the, at the beginning of the radiation-dominated era? Uh, and that, again, is an application, well, anyway, that, that, that really falls into the category uh, of uh, the sort of, eh, it has the flavor of those, those last previous week's topics. Um, but uh, then, so I wanna, I wanna do in a sort of introduction in the, in the latter part of today's lecture to inflation at the homogeneous level. What are the basic puzzles it, uh, what, what, what are the basic uh, cosmological puzzles that, that motivated, uh, that people were puzzling over in the early 80s when inflation was invented, uh, and then why, what does inflation have to say about those things? Um, and uh, then tomorrow's lecture we will, we'll then get to, you know, roughly speaking, most of the class so far has been about homogeneous cosmology, right? It's all been about uh, how the universe evolves, but, but the, the fact that, the fact that apart from when we looked at the cosmic microwave background, the fact that the, the fact that the universe is not completely uniform from one point to another didn't uh, play a big role in our discussions. And, uh, but, but, but in practice, our most detailed observational clues about the universe have to do with the fact that, that uh, we know that, that at, at very early times it was, it was homogeneous to a part in, in 100,000 with only tiny fluctuations in the density and curvature from one point to another. Uh, and then those, those tiny inhomogeneities at early times grew bigger and bigger over time until they grew into the large inhomogeneities like galaxies and clusters and you and me that we see in the universe today. Uh, so, yeah, we, wanna, we want to uh, uh, understand what's going on there. So the, so the starting point tomorrow will be uh, uh, introducing uh, quantum field theory and curved space-time. Uh, And that has two sort of famous applications. You know, there's basically Einstein's theory has two wild predictions, black holes and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the expanding universe and the Big Bang, basically. Uh, and when you apply, when you when you now uh, uh, put quantum fields on those two backgrounds and, and apply the uh, uh, framework of quantum field theory to them, you you find two the two famous uh, 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 results that black holes evaporate and they have a Hawking temperature. And uh, over here. Uh, if, if, if the universe, if the early universe, if the early expansion prior to the radiation dominated epoch, where did my radiation dominated epoch go? So prior to Big Bang nucleosynthesis, 
exactly how much prior is an open question, but uh, if at some point prior to that the universe did inflate, uh, then the application of quantum field theory and curve space time here is that it, it produces a spectrum of primordial perturbations, a scale invariant, uh, nearly Gaussian, nearly adiabatic spectrum of primordial perturbations. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's ultimately really what we're observing in the cosmic microwave background. And so we, when we observe the fluctuations, and so we want to understand what, what, what that all means and how the, how the calculation goes. Um, okay, but so with that, with that introduction, let's, let's do uh, baryogenesis. So, oops. Um, so again, as we said, as we as we had discussed earlier, uh, there is an observed fact about the universe today, which is that the number of uh, the number of quote unquote baryons, which is uh, where where when cosmologists say baryons, they mean just basically adding up all the protons plus neutrons in the universe. Number of baryons per photon uh, in the universe today is, is, a, is a measured number, relatively well measured now by both Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the cosmic microwave background. And the exact number is not critical for us here. And I'll get it wrong if I try to, if I try to write the exact number, but it's about 10 to the minus 9. Uh, and the question is why? You know, so this, this meant that at, at earlier times, uh, uh, at let's say up, up at a temperature of 10 GeV, so before protons and antiprotons annihilated, before neutrons and antineutrons annihilated, when they were still relativistic, uh, for every billion protons, there were about 10, there, there were about a billion plus one antiprotons. That's backwards. For every billion antiprotons, there were about a billion plus one protons. And so when they annihilated, what ultimately stopped the annihilation was just that these guys essentially all annihilated and then there was one proton left over um, that couldn't find a buddy to annihilate with. So why? Now, you know, a, a, an observational fact is that we have never observed any process in the universe that violates baryon numbers. Okay, so, so we, there, there's never been any experiment that has successfully looked at a bunch of baryons, let's say protons, uh, and uh, waited, you know, waited, tried to mess with them or just waited around to see if they would turn into something, uh, uh, something with, di with a different amount of baryon number. Uh, that's, that's never been observed. And so you might think, oh, well, if there's, if there's some, you know, if, if, if baryon number is, is conserved, is strictly conserved, uh, then I guess what we have to do is just put this in as, as part of the initial conditions of the universe. Um, and uh, yeah, so once upon a time that would have been the that would have been the uh, leading thought about it. That 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 that, that that's just that, that that's somehow you the, the problem is to come up with a theory of why you know not try to somehow generate this dynamically, but, 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 but maybe find a theory of initial conditions that, that says, okay, when the universe, when a universe is born, it has to be born with uh, an excess of baryons over antibaryons or, or just attribute it as a, to a random fact of the initial conditions. Yeah? If no baryon number violates, then we don't need to have bad initial conditions. We could have equal numbers and then the baryon number violating equalization would be what we keep it in. Yes, that's exactly right. That's what I was about to say. So, so what I was saying is that, is that uh, observationally, we have no evidence for baryon number violation. Uh, baryon number, baryon number is conserved observationally. On the other hand, it was it was realized by a tuft in the '70s that if you take the standard model Lagrangian seriously, then non-perturbatively, there even this even the, even the ordinary standard model with no new physics does violate baryon number. At the time, that seemed like an academic point because. According to a Tuft's calculation in the 70s, if you ask how long do I have to actually wait for a given proton to uh, 
decay, you know, to change into, how, how long do I have to wait to see, to see one uh, baryon number violating process? Uh, you know, one, one, one particle changes baryon number uh, to something else by one. It's exponentially longer than the age of the universe. Um, but then later on people realize that even in the standard model, uh, so that, 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 that's correct about the standard model at zero temperature. If you just ask at zero temperature, in, uh, uh, or, or at temperatures very low relative to the electroweak scale, uh, how long does it take for baryon violation to, to take place? Uh, it, it, it's so long as to not be relevant to us. But, uh, but now if you ask instead about a thermal plasma uh, above the electroweak temperature, as the early universe might have been, it turns out that above the electroweak temperature, this process, this, this baryon number violating process becomes very efficient. The, pro the, the, the process here is some, I'll just say the name, I'm not going to talk about it in any detail here, but there's the so-called Spaleron process, which is essentially the thermal version of the vacuum process that, that Atuf discovered. Uh, that, so even in the standard model, it, it turns out there is baryon number violation. Uh, furthermore, now, as I say, the, 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 the majority of cosmologists now, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think, well, there's a, that's actually something you should, you should, you should ask, I think you should ask Neil that question. I think the standard answer is no, but uh, I don't claim to have thought about that carefully. And I, I know that uh, Neil at one point was dreaming that maybe you could design an experiment that that uh, that uh, that would do it. You know, he has the, anyway. Yeah. Um, you no, know, the standard answer is is uh, is I think no. That you're that 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 it's 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 hard enough to get it's it's hard and rare enough at the LHC to get uh, individual collisions up at the up at the electroweak scale up above the electroweak scale. Uh, and uh, normally what you're talking about here is some, some plasma of size at least, at least as large as the, at least as large as the electroweak scale and radius of a bunch of uh, pl pl plasma of particles sort of heated up to that temperature. And um, you know, that you don't achieve in the LHC, but, um, uh, but I'm really, really not sure what the answer to, the, to that question is. So I don't want to. I don't want to quash some some potentially groundbreaking discoveries by saying by saying no. Um, anyway, uh, the other thing is that if in, if inflation really did take take place, uh, uh, then it also makes this kind of just just put the baryon asymmetry into the initial conditions uh, unpalatable because. Uh, we we think that the um, we think that the well if, if inflation is correct then then the universe expanded by a factor of of, of a, a increased by a factor of e to the sixty or something like that in the early universe at least meanwhile the baryon number would have diluted in that process by uh, a to the minus three times sixty at least. Uh, and so it would have had to, the asymmetry would have had to been, the baryon asymmetry, I should say, would dilute by that factor. So the, it would have initially had to uh, uh, be ginormous. Uh, and then the question why it would decrease by that factor and then suddenly stop out, peter out at the relatively tame number of 10 to the minus 9 uh, just, just, doesn't, just doesn't sound right. Um, so. That's all to say that we don't really know the answer, but the modern picture uh, is due to Sakharov. So Sakharov was the one who, who, uh, who suggested back when there was no, back in the 60s when there was no evidence of baryon number violation or theoretical reason to think that there was baryon violation. Uh, he suggested that never, nevertheless it seemed uh, uh, it seemed like a nicer explanation to him that uh, that, uh, that 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 the universe could start off with uh, in a state of equal baryon and antibaryon number, like you would expect uh, in thermal equilibrium with no chemical potentials, um, and then uh, you could dynamically produce a slight excess of uh, 
of baryon number over anti-baryon number, not due to some arbitrary feature of the initial conditions, but due to the dynamics of the universe. So in other words, ultimately it's the fundamental laws of nature, according to, according to Sakharov, which would be doing this. Um, and, uh, and so then he, he worked out the conditions that would have to be satisfied in order for this to take place, for such a scenario to take place. And these are the three so-called Sakharov conditions. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, condition one, he, uh, you know, it, is that he suggested, well, baryon number had better be violated. So even though there was no evidence at the time, he said if this is, if this is, if this is a more plausible uh, explanation for what's going on, baryon number has to be violated uh, to go from a baryon symmetric state to an asymmetric one. Also, that C and CP, symmetry, charge conjugation, and charge conjugation times parity, uh, both have to be violated because we, we're, we're going to go from a state with that is initially C and CP symmetric to one that's C and C CP asymmetric. Um, and then finally, that thermal equilibrium has to be violated. Uh, with the basic argument being that suppose you have some theory that violates baryon number. Um, uh, uh, so that there's some process that starts off with uh, baryon number one. Let's say there's some particle, particle X that decays uh, and maybe it has baryon number one, but when it decays, the decay products have baryon number two. Uh, well, so you create baryons that way, but in thermal equilibrium, uh, the inverse process will be going on at the same rate. So, so, so you'll, you'll be creating baryons at exactly the same rate as you uh, uncreate the baryons, and you'll, so you'll get no net benefit from that. Okay, so these are the so-called Sakharov conditions. Um, that uh, at the time sounded like kind of wild, wild, wild suggestions about the early universe when they were made in the 60s. Um, but now are sort of the, it's good, it's good to sort of, it's a sort of simple list to keep in your mind uh, that if you want to evaluate any proposed mechanism uh, uh, for, um, uh, if you have any idea about what could have produced the baryon number in the early universe, uh, this is the basic checklist that you want to go through uh, uh, before you begin calculating in detail. If it has all of those ingredients, uh, uh, you should go ahead and do the calculation in detail because it could be correct. If, if, if not, uh, then you know don't 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 proceed no further. Um, so let's see. And maybe I also wanted to just just pause for a minute to say about before we leave Sakharov, really really mentioning the Sakharov conditions is just an an opportunity to have a brief aside about Sakharov, who was just. I don't, so if you're not familiar with him, he's like a very significant 20th century figure. Um, he, uh, and, and, and one, of the, one of the two sort of great Soviet cosmologists. But so Sakharov was, uh, kind of, a, this is kind of like a theme in the course is meeting, meeting old Soviet era wacky cosmologists. But so Sakharov, uh, as a young guy, was one of the two. He and Zeldovich were sort of the two, or two of the key figures, two of the leaders of the Russian effort to build, you know, both both their nuclear bomb and their and their uh, and their fusion and, and and their their hydrogen bomb. Uh, and then Sakharov, uh, after. Sakharov then subsequently became a, a, a sort of anti-nuclear advocate uh, and uh, also just more generally a political dissident in the Soviet Union and spent a lot of his later life in, in uh, prison camps and won the 1975 Nobel Prize. I don't know if uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize for that. Um, never won the Nobel Prize in physics. But he made, but he was, he was really incredibly creative. Uh, so most people know Sakharov as a dissident, but Important to emphasize that he was also like one of the three great Russian geniuses of 20th century physics. And so his other things that he thought of, uh, uh, so he, he 
very early on uh, designed the Tokamak, the sort of modern design for magnetic confinement fusion to make fusion energy. So this is what, this is basically, you know, there's this European project ITER, which is trying, which, 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 uh, giant, giant, giant international project to build, to build, to build, uh, people have been building bigger and bigger tokamaks, and, uh, it is hoped that this will eventually, uh, be, be a design for a working fusion reactor for, for energy generation. Um, but then in cosmology, uh, he had, so in addition to, in addition to uh, this, which again, although simple, you know, proved to, well, first of all, reflected a lot of foresight. It, 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 this in particular seemed like a crazy suggestion at the time because, again, there was no experimental or theoretical evidence. Nowadays, we, first of all, motivated by this suggestion, uh, uh, with this suggestion in the people, in the back of people's minds, over the next 10 years, people, first of all, realized that the Cassandra model violated baryon number, but also then the, the 70s was also obsessed with uh, grand unification as a, as a proposed extension of the standard model. And in grand unification in particular, and more generally in most extensions of the standard model, there uh, uh, you, you, you do indeed predict uh, baryon number violation at some level. Um, so, so yeah, so he, he, had, he, had his, uh, he had his baryogenesis uh, ideas. That was, the, uh, that was very influential. And then finally, it's important to say that he, um, so both he and Zeldovich, after finishing work on the bomb, sort of migrated into cosmology. Uh, and uh, it was apparently Sakharov who realized, supposedly in a dream, that, 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 that the cosmic microwave background, that, that, that as density perturbations grew in the early universe, that, that they would oscillate acoustically, and so if you made a map of the if you if you made a map of the cosmic microwave background, you would see bumps and wiggles like the ones that we, the ones that are now observed, and and the, uh, you know when 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 you plot the power spectrum, you would see, you would see uh, bumps and wiggles because the universe took a snapshot of itself when some when some modes were at the maxima of their oscillations while other modes were at the minima, and so. You know, a lot of these things were sort of uh, discovered in parallel in the Soviet Union and the uh, and the West. Um, like a lot of things in 20th century physics, a lot of there was a lot of stuff that went on kind of in parallel because the Soviet Union was sort of cut off a little bit from Western science. But it appears that Sakharov got to this about about five years before um, before people in the West did. So, so th these are so these are Soviet cosmologists call these things Sakharov theories. Even though I think Sakharov had the idea and then supposedly told Zeldovich and Zeldovich and his students and yeah, I have worked it out in detail. Anyway, so Sakharov is kind of an interesting person. In case you, I don't know, is there, did, did, did everyone already know about Sakharov or, or am I telling you? These people, yeah, that's the thing. People. So I don't feel bad about inserting a little Sakharov into the cosmology course. Um, uh, okay, so you know, I really just wanted to say, oh well, let's see. So, so I think these two guys are intuitively clear. I just wanted to say uh, a word more of explanation about this, since this I probably this went by fast, and you may wonder what I meant by that the initial conditions were CP and C symmetric, and the final conditions were not. So, just to briefly explain that, um, you know, again, it's a simple, very simple point. What what Sakharov was proposing was that the dynamics of the universe would take you from a state where if you look at the distribution function for, uh, part, for particle species i, okay, so it, again, this is its phase-phase distribution function, so it evolves with t, and, and, it, and, it, and, and it tells you the density of expected particles at various points in phase space, labeled by the position and momentum of, of the coordinate. Um, now in, in FRW cosmology, uh, so you know, let's, let's assume that this guy respects the symmetries of FRW. So let's assume that for whatever reason, Sakharov isn't trying to explain this, but he's just taking it as an empirical fact 
that statistically speaking, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, so it doesn't depend on, homogeneous means it doesn't depend on x. Isotropic means it doesn't depend on the direction of p, only on its magnitude. So this is, so, so the distribution function only depends on t and the magnitude of the momentum. Um, and then what Sakharov wants is a mechanism that takes us from uh, an initial state where, where the distribution function for the particle species i uh, was equal to the distribution function for the corresponding anti-species. Okay, so he wants a situation where at time t initial, sometime t initial, the distribution function and the corresponding anti-distribution function are equal, and then at some time t final, they're not equal. Okay, at some t final, they're not equal. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, but now if you, if you think about how c, p, and t act, uh, so, you know, parity, uh, reverses the, you know, spatial parity reverses uh, spatial direction, so it takes p vector to minus p vector, uh, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it does not affect the uh, magnitude of p, so, um, So under, under parity, nothing happens here. These guys just get transformed to themselves. Uh, but um, uh, now time reversal is explicitly broken. But under charge conjugation, charge conjugation, uh, uh, so under parity, these guys would just transform like this. Um, but under charge conjugation, particles get swapped. Oops, sorry. Under charge conjugation, particles get swapped with their antiparticles. So if we, if this was charge conjugation, then F would get turned into F bar here, and F bar would get turned into F. Um, and, this, and similarly, since P acts trivially, the same transformation would hold for CP. And so his statement is simply that if you look at the initial condition there, consisting of fi and fi bar, that under C or Cp, it gets sent to fi bar fi. In other words, the position of the bar gets swapped. And uh, so in the initial state, where fi was equal to fi bar at the initial time here, if fi is equal to fi bar, this, this transformation is an identity transformation. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't change the state. So the initial state, that's the sense in which the initial state uh, is, uh, is C and Cp symmetric. But on the other hand, the final state uh, where fi is not equal to fi bar, then you know, these, 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 two, these two pairs of distribution functions will not be equal to the, the uh, this pair of distribution functions will, will, will be changed under this modification because f will change to f bar, which it's not equal to. So, okay. So I don't want to belabor the point too much, but uh, uh, just ho ho hopefully, that, hopefully that makes it clear. So the, so, so the initial state was invariant under C and Cp. The final state was not. The only way that the laws of nature can take a CP, C and CP symmetric state into one that's not is if they themselves violate C and CP. Um, so that's 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 all I meant. Um, uh, and then, uh, just very briefly, I wanted to uh, express that all a little bit more concretely, as, as uh, sketch how how an actual how an actual model. Um, Slightly more concretely, just sketch sketch how all of this plays out in an actual, um, uh, slightly more explicit form. So, 
imagine we have a theory with some particle x uh, that decays uh, into two different possible final states. So it decays into one final state F1, which has variant number uh, B1, and or an, alternatively into another final state F2, which has variant number B2. And uh, alternatively, so 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 if that's true, then then it's antiparticle X bar will be able to decay into uh, the corresponding antistate here, F1 bar, which has variant number minus B1, and and F2, which has variant number minus B2. Um, so now it turns out that, so CPT, so CPT in combination is thought to be a symmetry of any local or Lorentz invariant quantum field theory. CPT demands that the total decay rate, so, so, so the, the, the total decay rate for this guy will be gamma, and that'll be the sum of the decay rate into each of these two channels. Gamma is gamma 1 plus gamma 2. And then similarly here, gamma bar, the total decay rate, is gamma 1 bar plus gamma 2 bar. Um, so CPT invariance demands that, implies that gamma is equal to gamma bar, but uh, it turns out it does not imply that gamma 1 is equal to gamma 1 bar or that gamma 2 is equal to gamma 2 bar. In fact, if, if C and CP are both violated, then in general, these two branching ratios will not, will not be the same. Okay, the total decay rate will be the same, but the two, the two individual, uh, the, the, the first branching rate and its anti-rate need not be the same. So let's, let's say the branching ratio to this guy, you know, th this, th th this contributes a fraction R, has branching ratio R, and this guy has, has branching ratio 1 minus R, whereas this guy has branching ratio R bar, and this guy has branching ratio 1 minus R bar. If C and CP are violated, then uh, it turns out that's exactly when it's possible to have R not equal to R bar. So now just suppose we start off in the early universe in thermal equilibrium with a number density of X particles that, uh, that is equal to the number density of uh, X bar particles. And now let's so, and so in particular, let's, let's focus on the number density of X particles. Uh, if, if the number density of X particles over the total entropy density at the moment before these particles decay is, is some ratio, then let's, let's ask what the number density of baryons is per, per, per unit entropy density uh, after decay in the final state. Um, well, so we just do it as follows. We say, well, every, every X particle, uh, when it decays, uh, then a fraction R of the time, it produces baryon number B1. And a fraction 1 minus R of the time, it produces B2 units of baryon number. And then every time, an X bar particle decays, a fraction R bar of the time, it produces minus B1 units of baryon number, and a fraction 1 minus R bar of the time, it produces uh, minus B2 units of baryon number. Well, uh, uh, so, 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 so the, 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 the key point is that if you simplify the numerator here, it's just proportional to R minus R bar times B1 times uh, uh, B1 minus B2. Okay, right? This gives me R minus R bar times B1. These two guys give me minus R minus R bar times B2. Um, 
And so all three sacri and so 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 at the end of the day we get a non-zero net baryon number, excess of baryons over antibaryons. Um, and so you see the three Sakharov conditions all coming into play here. Again, as we said, in order for this to be non-zero, both of these factors have to be non-zero. The, the non-zeroness of this guy has to do with the branching ratio and anti-branching ratios being different. And that exactly requires violation of C and CP. B1 and B2 being different, that exactly is violation of baryon number because if you think about this X particle, it has two different ways it can decay. It can either decay into this state over here with baryon number B1, or it can decay into this state over here with baryon number B2. But then I can then think of building a Feynman diagram like this, where state B1 comes in, annihilates into an X particle, which then decays into a state with B2. And so baryon number is violated in that process. And then finally, violation of thermal equilibrium came into play here too, because in doing this calculation, I just imagined that every X particle, when it decayed, uh, turned into, you know, its final state with baryon number B1 or B2, and that was the end of the story. Uh, I completely neglected the, the inverse process where those, where those, where that, that final state of, let's say, three quarks with baryon number one could annihilate into one another to make an X particle. I said that that's, that the reason I was doing that is because I was, I was imagining that thermodynamically, uh, that, that, that is, uh, In other words, I'm, 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 I'm implicitly violating thermal equilibrium when I do that, yeah. Oh no, sorry, I'm not, I'm not assuming that S doesn't change in the process. Yeah, that's why I was, I was, I, I regretted a little bit saying that this, uh, here, um, so the picture, the picture is the following. Let's go back to my picture of the three sphere here. So this is the universe expanding. So now let me draw with a marker some little arbitrary volume on the surface. Uh, and, uh, and think about, think about the ratio of, of N over S in that, uh, uh, in that box. So in the process, as the universe expands during this decay, because the decay is not instantaneous, it takes place over some finite time. And so I think what you're pointing out is that both n, uh, the, the, the number densities and the, and the entropy densities are both diluting as one over a cubed as, the, as this box expands. But the total amount of entropy in this box is some, is some in fact, let's, 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 that's, maybe that's an easier way to say it. Imagine, let, let me calculate this ratio for some fixed co-moving box. I, I'll draw some fixed um, uh, box on here. And don't think about densities. We'll just calculate the ratio of the total number of x. We'll start with, I start by giving you a number, which is before, before any of the x particles have decayed, what's the total number of x particles in that box? And what's the total entropy in that box? Now the entropy does stay constant in the box before and after the decay. Oh, well, oh, so may, oh, the, you mean this is what you're asking? Oh, yes. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Indeed, that's another assumption. So, so if these guys actually dominate the, the energy density of the universe at this time, and then they decay, uh, that's a very good question. Sorry. That's different than what I thought you were asking. So indeed, uh, if these guys, if these X, heavy X particles, when they decay, uh, their energy density is big enough that they significantly increase the energy density in the radiation bath after they decay. That means that they have, they have significantly increased the, 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 the corresponding S. And so in, in, indeed, another implicit assumption that I was making in this calculation is that, is that the X particles are some subdominant contribution to the energy density. And so when they decay, they, 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 they increase the, let's say, let's say they make up 10% of the energy density. They, they, they may increase the, entropy density after decay, the, the radiation density of the plasma by 10%, and I, and, I, and, 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 I was, and I was neglecting that effect. But that's absolutely right in general, that, um, that if you want to do the calculation correct, if you want to get the actual correct calculation, get, get, get the numerical factor correct, uh, you need to take that into account. So if you want to, if you want to replace this equality by, by an equal sign, you need to take that uh, factor. Yeah, yeah, and in, in this calculation, I was just neglecting that, that's right. Um, okay, so that's, that, that, that's really all I wanted to say. I, I really just wanted to give a very brief taste, uh, not go into too much detail about this, but, but, 
just, just to give the general impression that uh, there is this important parameter about the early universe. We don't know its current explanation. Uh, the dominant view is that, is that something like this is going on. Uh, that view is based on largely, largely based on personal pre uh, uh, prejudice. But, but let's say every, every known mechanism for baryogenesis that relies on the laws of physics ultimately has this flavor, that it starts off with a universe with no baryon number and creates it, in which case we need to violate these three conditions. And this would just be an example of how if you had a theory, uh, if you had a theory in mind, uh, you, you would go through and check if it, if it, if it satisfied those conditions. You know, does it have some, some heavy particle? For example, if you want to achieve it by the decay of, of a heavy X particle, does, it, does that particle have a baryon number violating decay? Uh, does the C and CP violation give rise to decay rates with different branching ratios in the direct channel and the anti-channel? And is it uh, uh, heavy enough, let's say, when it decays that, that the decay dominates, that, that, that thermal equilibrium is not able to uh, uh, wipe out the decay by, by corresponding inverse decay uh, when it takes place? Does the decay happen late enough that that, 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 can't take, that, that doesn't happen? Um, okay, but but really, uh, yeah, I didn't. Well, this this in pr in practice, this this is how people actually thought it. Things happened uh, once upon a time. Uh, again, in the '70s, everyone thought grand unification uh, had to be right, um, and uh, and there are these there are these uh, uh, X bosons in, in, in grand unified theories that uh, because the leptons and fermions leptons and uh, quarks get grouped into the same multiplet, those, those, there, there, there are X bosons that do exactly have this property that they have two different decay channels like this. Um, uh, anyway, that, 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 that actual model of, uh, that actual grand unification based model of baryogenesis uh, has for various reasons become less compelling over the years. Um, there's another proposed way of doing baryogenesis now that seems more Let's say, I, to, to my mind, is the leading contender. But again, we don't know if it's right or not, so I don't want to get too much into the details. But which is just to say that, that uh, uh, in the standard model, uh, in the sort of simplest extension of the standard model that accounts for neutrino masses, in addition to the three light neutrino states we observe, there are three heavy neutrino states. Uh, those neutrino states are Majorana, and so they can, they, they're their own antiparticle, and they can decay uh, into, uh, in two different ways. One way which produces lepton number L1, one way which produces, then, then there's the anti-decay which produces lepton number minus L1. Because of C and CP violation, these two rates, again, don't have to be equal to one another. And so you, when, these, when these heavy guys decay in the early universe, they can produce a net lepton number. And then as the universe cools through the, elect, through the electroweak energy, this um, this Svaleron process uh, turns out can convert that left that 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 lepton number asymmetry that was produced by the heavy neutrinos into the baryon number asymmetry that we that we observe. Um, anyway, that goes under the name leptogenesis. In brief. And again, I would call it I would call it the leading contender in the sense that well, let me not get into what, exactly why it's the leading contender. The bottom line is we don't know. There's a puzzle. If any of you solve it, I will be delighted. Um, I mean, all these things, yeah. It's, it, it really it, it's very much uh, probably within reach solving this problem, but uh, we don't know the solution yet. In other words, I don't mean it totally in jest. You really can solve it. So. Go, you know, go do that. I mean, not right now, but uh, okay. Now, as usual, what is it with me? I normally I look up at the clock at about. There must be a huge slowing down that occurs somewhere about. Normally, I look up at the clock after twenty minutes, and I'm like, "Oh, this is great! I'm, I'm totally on time." And then suddenly, I look up again, and thirty minutes have elapsed. 
Anyway, I... Ah. Uh. Okay, let me pause. I, I suggest that we pause for one minute. I tell one joke. It's brief, simple. No, no, no dramatic uh, uh, lead in. Uh, then uh, I take five minutes to introduce you to everything you need to know about the homogeneous part of inflation because we have met a couple of these things earlier. Uh, Or maybe I'll have to begin at the beginning. Okay. In any case, let's 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 do the joke. See whether I can achieve anything substantial in five minutes, and based on that, decide what to do about tomorrow. But um, so yeah. So so uh, Anna Anna Kostuki reminded me this morning about about a, a joke, which is uh, if um, so so a rabbit gets on the tram. Uh, and uh, you know he puts down his suitcase and he he reaches up and holds on to uh, one of the handles. You know he's on his he's on his way to work and uh, uh, a minute later he looks down and his suitcase is gone and he loses it. He gets furious and he's like, "Okay, that's it. That's it. If whoever took my briefcase doesn't put it back this minute." The same thing is going to happen as happened yesterday. And uh, there's dead silence on the tram. And then uh, the, the lion finally is like, OK. And he look, goes, digs under his seat and pulls out the suitcase and gives it back. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I just I didn't know it meant that much to you. And, but you know, just tell me, what, what happened yesterday? And the rabbit says, yesterday they took my suitcase and they didn't give it back. <laughs> Anyway, um, that is very charitable of you guys to laugh at that so much. Okay, so inflation. Uh, the the uh, let's say the key the key message. So there's there's two parts of the inflationary story. Historically, there were these conundra, these puzzles that people were wondering about in the late 70s. And they had to do with, again, with the homogeneous evolution of the universe. They ultimately had to do not, not with thinking about perturbations, but, um, but just the, the overall homogeneous expansion of the universe. Um, and those were called the flatness puzzle and the horizon puzzle and the monopole problem. Um, and, and when inflation was suggested uh, in the, er, around 1980, uh, it's, it's the main thing that it had going for it was that it, it claimed to uh, solve or alleviate, ameliorate those problems. Um, then a couple years later, it was realized that it also uh, that it also predicted a primordial uh, scale invariant spectrum of density perturbations in the early universe. Uh, and OK, then that is the prediction that ultimately has been compared with the cosmic microwave background and been successful. And nowadays, uh, this is a much stronger, re this, is, this is really the reason that people, people uh, the, 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 that, that, that people uh, are confident in inflation. Uh, th this is a this by modern standards. This is a, this is a more uh, compelling reason than these guys. Um, but but these are important puzzles, and uh, so let's start by talking about let's start by talking about these guys. So the first thing to say is that 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 uh, there's kind of a simple geometric picture that you should there's kind of one geometric fact that you should keep in mind about what's going on here. So. Uh, there's sort of two basic length scales in the expanding universe. Okay, one is that one is so the there's the Hubble rate at any given time. Remember that's that's 
that's the derivative of a over the time derivative of a over a, a dot over a. So that has units of one over time. And so one over h of t has units of time. And so the speed of light uh, over h of t is uh, has units of length, and that, that's called the Hubble radius. Okay, so that's that's one key spatial length scale associated with the universe at any given time, and it evolves in time. Um, and then on the other hand, there is, you know, if we go to our picture of the universe where the, where the spatial slice is a three sphere, um, you know, remember that the radius of this three sphere, the physical radius is some constant co-moving radius, the radius of the maximally symmetric surface, and then it's, it's, it's increasing with time. So it's, it, it's some constant co-moving radius times the scale factor, which causes it, its physical size to grow with the expansion of the universe. And remember, we, we always just, uh, by convention, rescale the co-moving coordinates to set rho equal to one. Remember that was, we did that on the first day we met the FRW metric. So in those units, the scale factor is, is exactly, the scale factor at time t is the radius of the, radius of curvature of the spatial section at, at that time. Um, and, uh, okay, so those are our two length scales. And uh, so it's, it's interesting to consider the dimensionless ratio, which is the, 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 the dimensionless quantity, which is the ratio of those two guys. Um, so this guy divided by this guy uh, is called the co-moving Hubble radius. Okay, co-moving because normally in, in, in cosmology you have uh, you have a co-moving length, which is measured with respect to the co-moving coordinates on the sphere. And then if you want to convert a co-moving length into the actual physical length, the physical distance between those two things, you take the co-moving length and multiply it by a at that time, the scale factor at that time, to get the physical distance. So similarly here, this is called the co-moving Hubble radius because if you multiply it by a, you get the physical Hubble radius. Um, so, so let's let's think in terms of let's think in terms of co-moving coordinates. So let's just think in terms of the the natural coordinates on the sphere here. Um, around us today. Uh, the, the, the basic picture is the following, that, that when the universe is decelerating, when the universe is expanding, but the, but the expansion is decelerating, a double dot is negative, the co-moving Hubble radius is decreasing, is increasing, sorry. Okay, so when the universe is expanding during matter or radiation domination and decelerating, and if I, if, if this is me, and I draw the, if I draw, I draw the co-moving sphere of radius uh, one over ah around me. Okay, it's it's growing as the universe expands. It's growing to encompass a larger and larger. This this ball around me is growing to encompass a larger and larger uh, fraction of the balloon that I live on. Um, but when when the universe is accelerating. Then the story is the is the opposite that the that the co-moving Hubble radius uh, is is shrinking with time, and so if I draw the, if I draw it at a given time around me, it's getting smaller and smaller as the universe expands. It's it, the the co-moving Hubble radius around me is, is is getting to be a tinier and tinier fraction of the of the of the balloon that I live on, um, and so now the 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 basic geometrical picture is that. These three puzzles, uh, so in between the end of inflation, in, in between the beginning of the radiation dominated epoch and today, the universe has been decelerating. Well, it accelerated a little bit recently, but that's negligible. So the universe has, has undergone a huge, many orders of magnitude of decelerated expansion. And during that time, so if this was the co-moving Hubble sphere around me, uh, at, at the beginning of the radiation dominated epoch, it has now expanded by many, many orders of magnitude. And so it's a much bigger sphere now. 
Uh, and if the universe had always been radiation dominated all the way back to the Big Bang, that, that, that's all that would have happened, that, that the universe, the, the, this, this Hubble sphere would have started at zero size and expanded out to uh, its current size here. Um, but uh, the picture in inflation is that actually, the actual picture is as follows, that the, that the co-moving Hubble sphere around me at early, at, at, at sometime in the early universe was actually even bigger than the one today. So, so, so at very early times, the co-moving Hubble sphere around me was, was huge. Then the universe underwent a period of accelerated expansion during which it shrunk down to this tiny guy. At, that, at which point inflation ended, the accelerated expansion of the universe ended, and ever since then the universe has been decelerating and this thing has been growing bigger and bigger and bigger until it has reached its present size. And the essential geometric observation in inflation is that if the amount of shrinking that took place during, during uh, inflation is larger than the amount of subsequent growth that took place, in other words, if the initial co-moving Hubble sphere was larger than the one today, uh, then these three puzzles are resolved or alleviated. Um, Okay, so that's that's that that's the key message. And now I have now I'll, I'll, since I'm out of time, I'll, I'll leave until next until the first half of next lecture the explanation of what these puzzles are, uh, and why they're solved. Um, and then uh, during the second half of next lecture, we will turn to QFT and curved spacetime. Feels weird to end almost on time, doesn't it? You guys, I encourage you to race out before I'm tempted to 